Now, for anterior and middle fossa, if we want wide exposure, we're often using orbitozygomatic approach. And here's the approach down the sylvian fissure to the clinoid with the orbital roof intact. Here, we've done an orbitozygomatic craniotomy. It gets us much closer to this target area. It gives us a wider angle to work in, better light, and also increases of pretemporal and subtemporal approach. Uh, so it allows us to access all of this area of anterior and middle fossa. It gives us cavernous sinus, middle fossa triangles using OZ approach. It gives us increases of subtemporal approach as well as pretemporal approach. It allows us to do anterior petrosectomy that we talked about yesterday to expose anterolateral brain stem. It gives us transcavernous approach uh, and exposure along the sylvian fissure and access to basal cisterns. So, OZ approach is a uh, great approach for accessing skull base. We can do it as one piece, a two piece OZ. We can do a modified that does not include this part of the zygomatic arch that gives us access to anterior communicating area, anterior fossa, sylvian fissure without going down to the zygomatic arch. And when we elevate the galea from the pericranium in doing these exposures, anterior to the ear, we run into this plexal branches of facial nerve in the fat pad on the outer surface of temporalis muscle lateral to the orbit. And we want to preserve these facial nerve branches that course on the outer surface of the temporalis fascia so that as we elevate galea from temporalis fascia, we see the fat pad on the outer surface of the muscle that fascia separates into two layers on the outer surface of the muscle, a superficial and a deep layer. But the deep layer is still outside the muscle, and we can do an interfascial incision and fold that fat pad with the facial nerve downward with the galea. And then, if we want to do a bypass, we can save the superficial temporal artery. And here we plug the anterior branch into the M2, the posterior branch into the angular artery, the largest cortical branch. And then we, one of the most important muscles in getting a good cosmetic result is the temporalis muscle. And if you look at, to get a good cosmetic result, you want to save that neurovascular bundle to this muscle. And if you look at the temporalis muscle, the arterial supply, the venous drainage, and the nerve supply all come in from the infratemporal fossa to the deep surface of that muscle. So to get a good cosmetic result, when you're folding it downward, you want to do careful, cold, subperiosteal dissection that allows the preservation of this neurovascular bundle on the medial surface of the muscle. And then 
for the one piece orbitozygomatic approach, we won a keyhole, and out of the keyhole we said we have three cuts, one into the flap, one down into the inferior orbital fissure, and a third cut out of the keyhole along the orbital roof. But a properly placed keyhole exposes periorbita on one side, dura on the other side, and the orbital roof in the center. And a good place for the keyhole is on this frontosphenoid suture just behind this three suture junction. And if you get right on this area with a keyhole, you have periorbita below, dura above, and then orbital roof in the center. Uh, now, here we're on the left side. We folded the temporalis muscle backwards. And what suture is this? What bone is this? Frontal, and this is zygomatic. So that's frontal zygomatic suture. Down here we have this suture, and what bone is this? Sphenoid, so the suture is sphenozygomatic. And here we have frontal bone, and this is frontosphenoid suture. And so here's three suture junction. This is a good place for uh, keyhole, burr hole. If you move it forward, then you save less of the orbital roof when you turn the flap. But in the approach, we make one cut across the zygomatic bone here down to the temporal fossa part of the inferior orbital fissure. So this is the one piece. A two piece begins with a terional flap. And then we can make the cuts across the orbital roof from the extradural space. And that allows us to save more of the orbital roof. And we still come across the roof down to the inferior orbital fissure. We have a second cut across the zygomatic bone to the inferior orbital fissure. But this two piece includes the zygomatic arch and the orbital roof in the second piece. Uh, here's the two piece, the second piece, the cuts into the inferior orbital fissure. And by being extradural, we can get the cuts in the orbital roof down close to the lateral edge of the superior orbital fissure. And so this is the two piece. Uh, and we've talked about the advantage of dividing the zygomatic arch to get a low exposure along the temporal lobe. Now, of this approach, the part that we need the least is this part connecting the orbital roof with the zygomatic arch. Uh, and Attached to this area along here is the masseter muscle, so that if we do a one piece and we disconnect this masseter muscle that attaches above to the zygomatic arch, this muscle tends to clump downward and cause jaw pain, so that we, if we want to, we can uh, avoid this part of the exposure here and leave the zygomatic arch attached to the muscle and we can do convert this one piece 
to a two-piece, uh, allowing the zygomatic arch to be folded down with the masseter muscle to reduce the possibility of jaw pain with the exposure. Um, here we just see again the one piece, the keyhole burr hole comes through in the orbit well anterior to the superior orbital fissure. So that when we do a one piece, we say we uh, still have a lot of the orbital roof remaining after we elevate the one piece flap we often bite off the orbital roof, while if you do a two-piece, you can make the cuts down near the superior orbital fissure. You save much, of the, much more of the orbital roof in the uh, two-piece. In addition, in the one-piece or two-piece, where we have the zygomatic arch connected with this part of the flap, we have to disconnect the arch from the masseter muscle, but by uh, dividing the zygomatic arch anteriorly and posteriorly and leaving it attached to the muscle, uh, we avoid the problems with the masseter muscle so you can convert the two-piece into a three-piece that looks something like that. Here we start with the terional flap. The second piece disconnects the zygomatic arch anteriorly and posteriorly. We don't have to go over the zygomatic bone here. And the third piece is the orbital roof then. Uh, and we fold the masseter muscle down with the zygomatic arch attached to it. And it's easy to plate all of this uh, back together. These approaches give you access to all of this area. And one of the approaches that you can do through this route is the transcavernous approach. And here we're looking in through the optical carotid triangle, carotid A1 optic nerve. And for that transcavernous approach, we get between the carotid and third nerve, we usually work below the communicating to avoid these perforating branches, we begin by taking off the anterior clinoid. And then we open the oculomotor cistern, put a hook down the cistern, open the oculomotor cistern, and then we have access to the posterior clinoid and dorsum and we can work medial to the third nerve, drill off the posterior clinoid and dorsum, and get this transcavernous exposure back to the low basilar bifurcation. Now, for those approaches that involve the zygomatic arch that we need to get subtemporal or transcavernous, when we're going to the anterior communicating area, we don't need the zygomatic arch or that part of the exposure. We can do a modified orbitozygomatic where we go down and just elevate the roof and lateral wall of the orbit. We don't need this area, this temporal area. So we do this modified OZ approach. It gives us all of orbit, access along the sylvian fissure, anterior fossa, clinoid, over to the anterior communicating area. We have access to all of the orbit, uh, 
It's a great exposure for orbit, but it's one of the great routes to lesions here involving the area just in front of the optic canal at the orbital apex. Uh, and it allows you access to all of the middle fossa back uh, even to the internal acoustic meatus and through the petrous apex for the anterior petrosectomy approaches. Uh, here we've just drilled out in the Kawazis area the anterior petrosectomy and the approach to the internal acoustic meatus. And we covered all of this anatomy in detail yesterday. Uh, here we've elevated the trigeminal nerve uh, out of the uh, medial part of the middle fossa. Here we see greater petrosal nerve being joined by deep petrosal nerve to form Vidian nerve that runs along the floor of the sphenoid sinus, and this is six nerve coming below the petrosphenoid ligament through Dorello's canal.